pleasant uh, good afternoon. Uh, the topic, as we see, is, uh, has been abridged by uh, my brother there, uh, Dr. Um, Almandares. And it's really the Belize Guatemala conundrum and the inconvenient truth. And uh, let me try and I'll figure this out at some point. The content, and uh, I guess Dr. Almandares did mention that at some point I was a lecturer, and so I've kind of outlined this. This is what you should have coming at you. What is the relevance of the topic? What are truths? The processes of scientific truth. Where are we today? How can the situation be remedied? Why we should not go to the ICJ? And life after a no vote. Just as a footnote, I'm hoping that we have the right um, As a footnote, I normally ask people, what is the size of Belize? Anybody, any volunteers? Ah, hello? 8867. Wrong. <laughs> this is the size of Belize. Any and all claims of Guatemala to territory and rights, this is the size of Belize. The land area is 8867, the mainland area. The shelf area is 3641. Essentially, Belizean territory is about 22,765 square miles or 58,961 square kilometers. Learning objectives, I'm hoping that uh, after this presentation, you should understand the basis of GOB's position, the basis of the no to the ICJ position. You should recognize the need for an, an analytical framework and why you should say no to the ICJ. And we'll point you at the way forward should be in terms of our opinion. The relevance of the topic, a conundrum, it's intractable, it's puzzling, it's difficult. 160 years after 1859, we still have not been able to solve this intractable issue. It's an inconvenient truth. It is difficult to countenance. We're at a point in history where we are being asked a very, very difficult question. We're at a point where if all goes according to script, on the 10th of April, you'll be asked whether or not we should proceed to the ICJ. And this is a very, very difficult question. The outcome might be something that is difficult for us to countenance. The topic, this is very, very relevant in terms of the national conversation that we are having. You turn on your TV for, to, to basically view the news in the evening, and basically 25% of the content is an advertisement in relation to the ICJ. How do we define truth? My search is for truth. As a scientist, I need certainty. All right? And there are various versions of truth. There's a mathematical truth that says there's a relationship between a circle and the radius. And it's defined as pi. It's a mathematical truth. There's an alternative truth. You know what Mr. Trump said about alternative truths? There's biblical truth. This reality that we're experiencing was created in 7,000 years. It's not to be questioned. It's a biblical truth. The truth, the fact-based truth, is where I go as a scientist. And it's fact-based because of a number of things. It has to be supported by evidence. It has to be tested. It has to be concluded upon. And it can be rejected 
revised or adopted. That's a scientific truth. And I have decided that with all that has been said about ironclad and, iron, and, and airtight cases, let us apply the scientific method to this and see what we come up with. All right? Convenient questions. If you have an inconvenient truth, there are certain convenient questions that you might want to ask. And these convenient questions would include, is there such a thing as an ironclad case? Why didn't the Guatemalans want to go to the ICJ with the British? Under the current paradigm, is Guatemala going to court to lose? Somebody has said to a prime minister that Guatemala will go to court and gracefully fall on its sword. It's a part of the national conversation. Why is it wrong to seek an advisory opinion? That's a part of the, uh, that's a part of the conversation. Does Belize have a fallback position? Do we? Can the ICJ be trusted? We have seen that there has been a junket to the ICJ for people from the press to basically say this institution is inviolate. We will test that. Kind of gone to this to say that it has to be scientific truth, has to be verifiable, it has to be evidence based, it has to be logical, and it has to be testable, and you should be able to replicate. And just to I'll throw this at you, I don't know how many people in here right now as students um, are scientists or scientists in the making. And essentially what we have is that there are experiences that would pique our curiosity. And if you look at this uh, diagram or this figure, at 12 o'clock, this basically saying there is this ICJ issue that is coming at us. And I will need to ask myself certain questions. And so we go to, you have to think about interesting questions. Why now? Why not 10 years from now? Do we have to solve this now? Ask yourself certain interesting questions. You might want to formulate a hypothesis. Perhaps we really believe that we can solve this problem right here, right now. And we might construct a hypothesis. And when we construct that hypothesis, we want to make sure that a part of the cycle is that it has to be tested. And for it to be tested, obviously there's the issue of experimentation, there's data, and there's issues of conclusion, and you might end up going the full circles with theories, etc. The point is that scientific truth has to be testable, and it follows a, a general, a logical sequence. My preliminary observations, based on the conversation thus far, is that although I have heard a plethora of views and opinions on why we should go to the ICJ by the GOB and the yes to the ICJ proponents, there is this lingering feeling that something is missing that we are not being told about. And it is not only me that feels this way, many other people feel this way. I took my daughter-in-law to a uh, passport office yesterday and she said, uh, Mr. Maivit, I don't know what to do. I am confused. And I said, you're not alone. <laughs> if you have observation, scientific question would be, is Belize ready, really ready for a date with the ICJ under the current paradigm of the compromise? And under the skewed yes only policy of the GOB, it's a policy, you know, it's not just propaganda, it's a policy of the GOB in the absence of rigorous strategic and analytical approach to the dispute. Are we ready? The hypothesis, my hypothesis, 
My hypothesis is the long and tenuous history of the dispute has shown that the desire to solve it includes to solve it includes both of the principal contestants. However, that is Belize and Guatemala. However, there are extra regional political forces also seeking a solution for their own ends that would prefer Belizean territory and rights as a part of the currency to solve the dispute whose solution may not be in the best interest of Belize. Long story short, this dispute, the solution to this dispute, does not only involve Belize and Guatemala. We do know that it has now gone hemispheric, and we now have the OAS. We also know that Britain and the United States has been party to this, to this dispute. All right? Evidence. What is the evidence for my hypothesis? Well, a part of the evidence is Belize has really lost the diplomatic high ground. Belize was at the diplomatic high ground leading up to independence. We have lost the diplomatic high ground. And my analysis is that there's really no, no strategic dimension to how Belize is treating with this issue. My analysis of the situation is there's no analytical framework. If you are venturing in a development context uh, in relation to this particular problem. One of the things that you would want to do is to do a SWOT analysis. Let us look at GOB as an institution and let us look at the strength, weaknesses, and opportunities of threat. Let us look at cost-benefit scenario. Let us look at the problem analysis to see where we are. That is what we need to do. What we are being bombarded with is say yes to the ICJ. And so we are saying that's one script. But if you take a scientific tool to this, it is basically saying that you need to be very analytical. One of the things that I believe has plagued us, especially in terms of foreign affairs, is that Belize has failed to make the distinction between an imperfect friend and a deadly enemy. Guatemala is not a friend of Belize. GOB's approach is a disproportionate reliance on expert opinions. My motivation for doing this, my paper is uh, 62 pages long. My motivation for doing this is whenever you have a presentation, by the yesterday ICJ proponents, there's an overabundance of resource materials. The Belize Peace Movement, whenever we go, we use that same material. And I felt that we needed some text. There has to be some resource store that could support our arguments and our views. And this is my motivation for having done this. So uh, the GOB side basically has an overabundance of opinion, of resources. There's a heavy pro-ICJ propaganda campaign. There's what I call a selective amnesia on the facts. Dr. Carl himself, and he's here with us, has basically said, you have to countenance the reality that the narrative that we have been uh, essentially embraced, that as the British went from the Cebuan to the Sarstoon, they met no one. It was an empty country. That is the British reality of history. That might not be the reality in total of history. And so you have to be in a position to say, let us look and make sure that we have the universe of evidence to treat with this issue. My friend, uh, one of my colleagues, I believe he presented yesterday, uh, we have characterized the Belize government's position as the 4 a policy, which is the policy of appeasement, acquiescence, accommodation, and adherence. Oh, the Guatemalans have annexed the SARS too. And you know what the Belize government uh, response has been? It has not been annexed. Evidence-based data, and I'll go through this one. 
essentially where we are right now is that there has been a failure of 1931, the exchange of notes of 1931. In 1859, we basically got Belize's bedrock, the 1859 treaty that basically says, this is your domain, uh, British Honduras, and it described the borders of Belize. Left? Oh. No. <laughs> it described the borders of Belize, and essentially um, what it does is the Guatemalans have basically said to Britain, we will not proceed with the demarcation of this border. They did the, the Gracias Sedos and Garbage Fall, and they walked away from the process. They said to, British, to Britain, you owe us money. So the demarcation was not complete. Fast forward to the Webster proposals. Webster proposal basically said, uh, Belize, you will be granted independence but it is colonialism 2.0. Guatemala will be responsible for your defense, and they'll be responsible for your foreign affairs, and they will have the freedom of movement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Dito 1981, this is exactly uh, version 2.0 of 1968. All right? 1992, believe it or not, Guatemala said to us, we don't have any treaty with you, Belize. Let us sign something, and you know what we signed? we signed a joint agreement that says there is no internationally recognized border between Belize and Guatemala. You know what the Guatemalans did? They squatted on the Sar Stone. CARICOM wrote to them, and you know what they wrote back to Belize, what they wrote back to CARICOM and said? What are you talking about? We have signed an agreement with Belize where they are agreeing with us that there is no internationally recognized border between the two countries. And so the Sar Stone has become an internal waterway of Guatemala. So we, we, we have gone here. We have gone to the special agreement where we are asking the court, if this goes forward, please, ICJ, define to us where our boundaries are. All right? And of course, um, the next step is the referendum. Um, this has been sent to you. I know I won't get through all of this. But as students, basically what I did, I did a, I did, and I'll go to this, I'll go to this. This is the first test that I did. If you're going to court, you need to know what the risks are, if you have a choice. And risk can be defined quantitatively, or it can be defined qualitatively. The risk is defined as the probability of something going wrong times the cost of something going wrong. Our economy is essentially a $3 billion economy. If we operate on the premise that Guatemala is actually seeking, according to the Prince Alibre, from the Cebu South, and we round it off to 50%, and we apply this formula, all right, one, two, three. If we apply formula one, for a 50% chance that Guatemala could win, for a 50% chance that Guatemala could win, you know what the risk to Belize is in a $3 billion economy? It is 750 million units. For a 5% chance that Guatemala can win at the ICJ, if Belize goes and we have a 95% chance of winning, the probability is still 75 million. Word on the street is, or I guess, uh, let, me let me rephrase that. In layman's language, what people on the street are saying, why should we gamble Belize with Guatemala when Guatemala is bringing nothing to the table? You know what this formula is saying? That the risk to Guatemala in terms of its probability, the probability that Guatemala will lose something is zero. And the cost of Guatemala of losing something is zero. So mathematically, the risk to Guatemala is zero, and the risk to Belize is untenable. All right, that's a qualitative risk analysis. All right, this, um, I'll just ask you to go, essentially, students, 
to go to this, but I'll just hit on a couple of them. Risk qualitatively defined, we might be looking at the magnitude, the probability of something going wrong, and the, the level of rating of the risk. And if, for example, we look at this one, blind faith, blind faith in the ICJ. Various papers are not coming to the fore. There's a paper written by Richard Posner from the University of Chicago that basically said, when the ICJ first started up in 1946, between 1946 and 1960, rulings were heavily in favor of the developed nations. The developing countries that were just becoming independent recognized that this was not a destination for them to settle, including territorial disputes. So the newly independent nations were pulling away from the ICJ. The ICJ kind of reversed its, uh, its rulings and began ruling in a way that was consistent with the developing world. Obviously, that did not sit well with the developed world, and they began to withdraw. Where we are now with the ICJ, it's really a theater of great uncertainty. When you go to the ICJ, there are a number of issues at play. One of them is those judges are only human beings. Richard has found in his paper that they are influenced by geopolitics, they are influenced by the uh, development circumstances of nation. If you have a judge coming from a developed country and he's sitting on a case involving one party might be a developing country, it does have a bearing. What Richard has found is that a fair amount of the ruling are outside of the ambit of the law. So I would say, and I just wanted to go with your permission, I'll just fast forward to the last slide, but I'll, you know, this paper is available. I'll just fast forward to the, to the last slide. My conclusions based on what I have said is that the GOB is not competent to treat with the ICJ for a variety of reasons. People ask these things, and I'll just put that up there for you. After the no vote, what then? Well, after the no vote, we have a short-term solution that basically said 100 days. You know Belize has no Guatemala policy. There's none. The only policy that the GOB has is let's go, let's go to court. That's the only policy we have, and people are asking common sense questions. Why are we trading with Guatemala when, in fact, trading with Guatemala has implications? It has economic implications. It has empowerment implications. If you're trading with Guatemala and it's skewed, you're enriching the military class of people and you're enriching the economic classes of people who are fanning the flame of this discontent. So one of the things that we need to do is to articulate a national policy to treat with Guatemala. One of the other things that we want to do is to develop a contingency plan. If this thing goes wrong, there's no hint there's no hint from the government that they are even thinking about contingency planning. We treat with people in the bushes and people are saying, but one of my former employees at Fisheries Department is saying to me, Mr. Maivet, I live in uh, Malati, Gates Point, Malati. And if, if we lose at the ICJ and we lose territory, what will happen to my property? Who will compensate me? When are we going to have this conversation? And I'm just mentioning this to say that this goes into what I've been saying. We are not analytical, and we have not been treating very sensibly with this as a nation. Um, medium term, I just want to show you that we have medium term also. And one of the issues that is being basically not supported by the government in terms of their campaign, they're saying what we don't need an advisory opinion. And we are saying, our oh, contrary, you need an advisory opinion. You know why you need an advisory opinion? This is uncertain territory. Although you are convinced that you have an implied case, the evidence, as I have analyzed them, points in an opposite direction. And what you should be doing is when you are uncertain, this is why people go for, for advisory opinions. We are saying, go for an advisory opinion, man. Although you think that you have a case that will take you to victory, we don't share your enthusiasm. Take a pause and analyze what you have in front of you. 
you are going to court without knowing what Guatemala is claiming. How can I, George Maivit, do an informed, a uh, critical analysis? I can't, because although the information that has been proffered to the government in terms of legal opinion, they are interesting, but they are not necessarily informed. I could only evaluate if they are informed if I know what you'll measure them against. All right? And so one of the issues that we have to do is we have to professionalize the diplomatic staff. Bring the boys back home. Bring the cronies back home. It's not a holiday. Bring them back home. Let us train diplomats. Because this should be purpose driven. It's not a holiday. And I'll just uh, go to the last one, and I, I must say that I appreciate your grace. <laughs> and the last one is 30 seconds. Thank you, sir. The last one is political reform that has to include certain things. You know, my instinct when the foreign minister signed the compromise in 2008 was. But how can he sign that without consultation? You know, in fisheries, one thing that we have learned is that in fisheries management, you're really not in fisheries management that I spent 90% of my professional life. It's not about corralling barracudas and snappers. It's about managing people's behavior. And if you're managing people's behavior, they need to be consulted and they need to be consulted meaningfully. And a part of what we need to do in political reform is to say that there has to be consultative consultation, which means that the stakeholders will not only have an input, but that input must inform what your policies going forward should be. I thank you for your graceful uh, entertainment. I, I didn't know that, um, as a scientist, I, has, I have to say that um, there might be wormholes in, in time that we're not aware of. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.